we were interned first uh, in the swamps of Arkansas, a camp called Rower. And uh, we made a pilgrimage uh, quite uh, frequently to the uh, camp in uh, Arkansas, Rower. And the, the place was completely changed. I remember it as kind of a swampy place surrounded by a forest that I called the jungle. But uh, they had drained the swamps and chopped off, uh, chopped down all the trees. Uh, the only remaining portion that uh, was a part of the uh, internment camp was the uh, cemetery. And I, as a child, was never taken there. And as I walked around the cemetery reading the uh, headstones, I was struck by the number of headstones that said, Baby Yamada. Baby Tanaka, Baby Yasui, no first names, and the, death, the birth and death date year was the same. Hospital care was very poor, very uh, a few uh, medicine in at all, and so many of the babies were either stillborn or died shortly after birth, and so they had no first names. I was really struck by that. But what really moved me was in the center of the cemetery was a crumbling concrete pylon. And at the base were the names of all the young men who went from behind those barbed wire fences, drafted into the army, and fought for this country. They were, they were put into a segregated, all Japanese American unit, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team that chose as its uh, uh, regimental model, go for broke. They were determined to give it their all. They were sent to the battlefields of Europe, sent out on the most dangerous missions, treated the used like cannon fodder. They sustained the highest combat casualty rate of any unit proportionally uh, of the entire Second World War. But when the war ended, they came back as heroes. They were the most decorated unit of all of the entire Second World War. And that record still stands today. They were greeted back on the White House lawn by President Harry Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. That story moved me very much. And at the base of that crumbling concrete pylon were the names of all those young men, young men, teenagers, some of them, who went from imprisonment by that government and fought for this government and perished for this government. And the American flag that covered the coffin of these young men were brought back to their wives or their parents, still behind those barbed wire fences. And I lost I lost it up. Tears just poured down my face. This is part of the story, small part of the story, but an important part of the story of the internment of Japanese Americans. I understand that there's some division here between the local people and the Japanese Americans or the uh, internment camp story. I want you to all understand that what happened to us was an American story. We are American citizens who happen to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. We have nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. We are Americans of Japanese ancestry. And yet, it was three things. War hysteria, race prejudice, and reckless, irresponsible political leadership that fanned the flames of fear and ignorance. In California, we had an attorney general, a top attorney for the state. He was a brilliant man, but he was also a fallible human being. He wanted to run for governor, and he saw that at that time, the single most popular political issue in California was the lock of the Japanese, and I'm using the long word for Japanese. There was a three-letter word for Japanese, which I will not use. 
lock up the Japanese. And this attorney general decided, because he wanted to run for governor, to get in front of the issue, became an outspoken advocate for lock up the Japanese. And he made an amazing statement. He said, we have no reports of spying or sabotage or fifth column activities by Japanese Americans. And that is ominous because the Japanese are inscrutable. You don't know what they're thinking. So it would be prudent to lock them up before they do anything. So for this attorney, the absence of evidence was the evidence. And the flames of racism and hysteria was fanned by this attorney general. And that went all the way to the presidency of the United States. And the president of the United States, another great man, signed Executive Order 9066. This attorney general went on to become elected governor of California. He was re-elected twice, a record at that time. And then he went on to be, to be appointed the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Some of you may recognize his name, Earl Warren. Earl Warren has a checkered history. This is our story. It is not a Japanese American story. It is an American story because what was egregiously violent was the Constitution of the United States. This is our story, all of us, as Americans. It is an American story that every American should know so that we never allow this to happen. And yet, this is a very relevant story to our times today because we hear the same echoes of those hysterical today in our presidential campaign. And it is chilling that there are so many people that are being stampeded by that kind of xenophobic rhetoric. It is our story as Americans. Thank you.